Our second speaker is Dr. Krzysztof Geras from New York University. And actually this presentation will be uh, given from New York. Uh, Krzysztof is assistant professor at uh, NYU School of Medicine, and he's also an affiliated faculty at uh, Center for Data Science at the same university. Uh, his main uh, interests are in super unsupervised learning with neural networks, uh, model compression, transfer learning, evaluation of machine learning models, and application of all these uh, techniques to medical imaging. He was a postdoc at NYU. He did his PhD and master's at the University of Edinburgh and uh, BSc from the University of Warsaw. And he also has extensive practical experience from his industrial internships with Microsoft, Microsoft Research, Amazon, and JP Morgan. And this presentation uh, will be about uh, explainable new deep neural networks for medical image analysis. So it's a very re relevant and very interesting topic. So the floor, well, the screen is, is yours. Thanks. Uh, so great. So could you confirm that you see my, that you see my, oh, okay. So you don't, you don't see me. Okay. You, it seems like you don't see me changing my slides. Uh, okay. So, you know, what? maybe let me, okay. Let me share. Okay, maybe you just need a restart now. No, you just don't see me changing my slides. Okay. Um, okay. I think, okay. We'll have to somehow fix it very quickly. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, okay. Let, okay. So I have a, okay. Let me stop sharing and then, uh, okay. That's a good, that's a good idea. Okay. So now I will start sharing my screen again. Okay. And I believe now you should see, yeah, now you should see me. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Now you should see uh, me changing my screen. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I am so I am from um, NYU, um, and uh, you know NYU is a big university, so actually I come from a few different places within NYU. Um, so I'm, you know, my background is in machine learning, and I have uh, I have been working on neural networks for a few years, and then uh, I also got interested in uh, applications of deep learning in medical imaging, and that's what I've been working on for the last uh, for the last three four years. Um, so my talk is going to be about um, um, my talk is going to be about basically what I have learned in this period uh, from a perspective of a person uh, interested in deep learning. Um, so I think the first thing that everybody interested in machine learning or deep learning um, would be surprised about when uh, thinking of, well when encountering medical imaging for the first time is that. Medical imaging uh, is actually a very complex uh, domain, and it has there are many different tasks within uh, medical imaging that actually, um, you know, that actually, yeah, that actually form uh, form this uh, form this domain. So um, there's you know, so there are different imaging modalities such as ultrasound, X-ray, uh, CT, MRI, and then. There are multiple learning tasks, right? Like classification, segmentation, detection, and reconstruction. So, actually, it only makes sense to talk about a particular problem if you consider one choice on the, you know, on the y-axis, one choice on the x-axis, and then very often something that you're going to do is actually going to be uh, dependent on the part of the body or a other or a clinical question that you want to solve with this data. So this is actually making it uh, very complex uh, to 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 do something uh, very powerful in the domain. Um, and there are there are even more challenges, right? So uh, the first uh, challenge that everybody encounters when starting to work on uh, deep learning for medical imaging is that the data sets that are public are actually very small. So uh, hospitals are generally not very keen to share private data. Uh, and, and there are legitimate reasons for that. It's not just that they just don't want to. Um, but there are some exceptions, such as such expert, fast MRI. You, you can look into these data sets if you're interested. Um, 
And then labeling med medical imaging data is also very difficult on the pixel level. And it is uh, difficult objectively often, just because it is uh, difficult to say whether something is really cancer or whether something is some other kind of a lesion. And operationally, it is also very difficult because it's, um, well, because uh, it, is it is simply difficult to take a medical expert and um, put this person in front of a computer for an extended period of time to collect these, uh, to collect these segmentations. Um, and in addition, there are some there are some difficulties related to, to machine learning, right? So medical imaging data, unfortunately, has very different properties. And the networks that have to be designed for medical imaging data have to be different to work for this kind of images. Um, and finally, even though we are used to uh, neural networks such as ResNet, DenseNet, and we accept that uh, they are accurate in, in medical imaging, it is often too little because these uh, neural networks don't have any direct mechanism to explain their prediction. And that's that kind of explanation is really necessary in medicine uh, to build trust between the uh, the neural networks and the users of the neural networks, which are medical doctors. Okay, so let me illustrate uh, the first difficulty that I mentioned: the difficulty of uh, small small data. Um, this is an illustration of the size of the ImageNet dataset. It's approximately 14 million images, and it's probably not even the largest data set like that that there, there exists uh, right now. Well, it definitely isn't. Um, and that is the size of the largest uh, public data sets uh, containing uh, breast cancer screening images. It's only 10,000 images, right? So, so, of course, you're not going to be able to learn very much from such a small data set. So, um, so I'm very interested in this problem of uh, interpreting breast cancer screening uh, exams with um, neural networks. And when I started to work on that, I actually had to create my own data set uh, from the data from, uh, from the NYU hospital system. And we managed to create this uh, NYU breast cancer screening data set of about 1 million images. But that is uh, something that really took us actually probably approximately a year, and we are my students and postdocs are still working on improving this data and collecting new data. It's a, it's a never ending project. Um, so it actually took us so much time that we even created this uh, technical report where you can, that you can look at and you know, understand all of these steps. Um, there is very little material on the internet on actually how you should really pre-process medical images. So I think this is, uh, but this might be very useful for, for many of you who are interested in working with this kind of data. OK. Um, the next difficulty of working with medical data is its size. So this is a how large typically the images are when they are used in uh, ImageNet classifiers. And this is how large the images are in breast cancer screening. And um, the difficulty of here is that even though, well, of course, you could say that ImageNet images were actually bigger, uh, they were resized to this, to this, to such tiny ones. But uh, you can't really do this with very often. You can't really do this with uh, medical data, just because you will lose information that is often very. You know, it is localized in some very small region of the image, and if you resize it, you're going to lose it. Um, so let me illustrate this. This is okay. So uh, this is a picture of something, and you okay in the in the bottom in the top in the bottom left corner, uh, you you see a very small image. So you could you should uh, maybe well you can't tell me, but you should make a guess in your head what it is, and I expect that many of you will actually be able to make a pretty accurate guess about it already. And uh, right now, probably 99.9% .9 of you already know what this object is, right? And I, and of course, of course, it was obvious from, from the very beginning, it was a panda. Um, and 
this kind of property that we can resize those images, uh, those natural images, and uh, we can still recognize the class is something that we very often take for granted. But it doesn't have to be true. Well, it is it is not true for uh, for many other types of data. Uh, here, this is you know so. You cannot tell whether this person has cancer, right? So like this is this is a very small picture of uh, this is a very small radiograph, uh, breast radiograph, and of course you cannot tell whether this person has cancer or there's something else with this person, right? It's just uh, just it's impossible to diagnose uh, this person from such a tiny image, and even even the full scale image uh, would be referred to by radiologists as uh, non-diagnostic, basically. A medical expert would decline to make any kind of diagnosis from even from this this kind of this size of image. They, in fact, they would need a special monitor, uh, and you know, with very large resolution, and only then they would accept accept it and try to try to make a prediction. Yeah. So okay then. Okay, so maybe uh, since we started talking about breast cancer screening, maybe let me tell you some more details about it why this is important. So it's it's a very common uh, medical procedure. In the US alone, there's about, there are about 40 million exams performed every year. Uh, about 40, 250,000 women um, are diagnosed with cancer and approximately 40,000 lose their lives to cancer. So it is not just a interesting uh, machine learning question to solve, but it is also of uh, great importance. Um, because you know, even if we if we make an impact on this problem with deep learning, uh, then we could potentially maybe we cannot save everybody, but maybe we can reduce this number, you know, by I don't know, maybe twenty or thirty percent. So it is a there's a huge impact that there is in in medical imaging, not just breast cancer, but in breast cancer in particular. Okay, um, this is what these images look like uh, in breast cancer screening. There are four images because the, every um, healthy woman has two breasts, uh, has two, two breasts, and there are two angles at which these uh, X-ray images are taken. So that's why they, they have, uh, that's why there are always at least four images in this kind of exam. Um, and we actually consider only the beginning of this workflow uh, what I mean by that is that screen mammography is just the first element of uh, this this work this diagnostic workflow that le ultimately leads to um, ultimately leads to cancer diagnosis. So at the beginning, uh, the radiologist is just making only a prediction of whether this person has no cancer for sure or whether this person needs further uh, imaging, right? And this imaging happens in the form of ultrasound or diagnostic mammography, which shows. Uh, more specialized views of the breast. Uh, then in the next step, again, uh, the radiologist only makes a prediction of whether this person doesn't have cancer, whether they can rule out the possibility of cancer or whether they need more imaging. And this imaging is done again with uh, MRI, a more expensive technique, but uh, more accurate in certain cases. Then, then this, uh, there is a biopsy performed. Uh, a pathologist looks at this biopsy sample and then only at the very end of it, um, in the standard medical procedure, uh, we actually can know whether this person had cancer or didn't have cancer. So what we do here is we just look at these images and we just want to make a prediction uh, about the very end of this process. And hopefully, if we can do this accurately, then maybe some of this imaging can be avoided, right? So maybe we don't, it, it might be that we can avoid all of these medical me imaging procedures if someone doesn't have cancer. Um, okay, so what we practically do in terms of machine learning is we take these four images, we have some learning model, and then this learning we train this learning model to uh, make a prediction about uh, the two breasts, um, whether there's whether this patient has uh, some has some um, well has a, some malignancy in their breast or not, and Secondly, we also ask this uh, prediction model uh, whether there is some benign change that also um, maybe needs to be taken care of in some other form. Okay, so as a baseline, we trained a relatively simple uh, neural network. So we took these uh, four images, uh, 
we first uh, we first uh, focused on making just local predictions uh, for these uh, for for these four images. So we actually trained a network only on patches of these images, and those those patch classifiers produce these uh, heat maps that you see here. So there's uh, so we have for each image uh, we actually have uh, three three heat maps, right? So there's one. So there is this original image. There is the heat map indica that indicates uh, local prediction of malignancy and local prediction of benign lesions. And then we took uh, relatively standard networks, uh, something like ResNet twenty two. So this is like our this is our slightly modified version of uh, ResNet eighteen. Um, we did global average pooling on these representations learned by these uh, networks. We concatenate them uh, view wise, so the CC views and MLO views. Then we just took some, put some fully connected layers. Uh, we made four predictions for these uh, four targets that I explained. So we averaged the, we averaged them, and that's our final prediction. Um, so this is so far a pretty simple network. Uh, this is you know like deep learning 2017, I would say. Um, but it turns out that's actually already a pretty, it's actually a pretty accurate network. So we have. Um, Done a reader study uh, with uh, real radiologists and uh, real exams that uh, hist real historical exams. Um, it's a relatively large reader study. Uh, we have 360 exams with a biopsy and 300 negative exams, so altogether 720 exams. Uh, there were 14 readers, um, and we asked radiologists only to make a prediction of malignancy. Right, so. What I mean by that is that we only ask them about these targets. Uh, we don't ask them about whether there's something benign because it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit harder to, um, it's a little bit harder to predict, and it's also less important. So, so we, so we only ask them, ask them for these, uh, for these predictions. And what we found is that um, individual radiologists are quite accurate, but um, maybe not as accurate as you would. Expect if you didn't know more about this process, but in terms of AUC uh, area under the ROC curve, the radiologists achieve approximately 0 0.8, and uh, you know, so you could think that this is maybe relatively low, but then uh, this is a task that radiologists are not necessarily used to predict exactly this, the same way because here we only give them those images. We don't give them any access to uh, prior history of the patient. We don't give them access to other imaging modalities, etc. So, um, so that's 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 why they you know so that's why they don't uh, maybe don't can't necessarily completely solve this task uh, with this data. And our model actually uh, our Pretty simple model, arguably here, is is a little bit more accurate than the radiologists. But um, if all of these fourteen radiologists team up, then they can still outperform our model. And of course, it is not a very realistic uh, model because you cannot ever have fourteen radiologists teaming up. Uh, it just would be you know too expensive. It's impossible in practice. But if you uh, ensemble the radi individual radiologists and our model, then this ensemble does better than both our model and, and, and any individual radiologists, right? So that's a very interesting observation, uh, given the, this difference in performance between the two. And it indicates that even though uh, our models are accurate, there's there still must be something that the radiologists are learning from the data that the network can't. Uh, so they just must be using some other types of information. That's why this ensemble is uh, is better than the model itself. And we can also finally ensemble uh, the radiolog ensemble the ensemble of the radiologists with our model, and that's even better. That's even stronger. That's the that's the best uh, here. Okay, and um, you can see here. Uh, so this is a so this is an ROC curve and precision recall curve. Um, there you can see the average reader uh, in these studies, and the, those individual lines represent different readers. Uh, the purpose of this figure here is just to show you that uh, if we if we actually create a hybrid of uh, each reader with uh, our network, then 
those hybrids uh, are better in both metrics and they also become much more similar to each other. So um, you know, some of these readers might, you know, might have prior to years of experience with, uh, with, um, with radiology, some of them maybe are just starting, but uh, the, this network can actually uh, make them perform all very high. So I think that's also a very important aspect of, of this work. Okay. Um, all of these, uh, so this network uh, with trained weights uh, and a detailed instruction of how to use it is uh, on GitHub. You can uh, go there and download it. As you see, uh, many people already have done that. It is on the AGPL license, so you can, as long as you, um, as long as you obey the AGP license, you can do actually a lot with it. So it's a, I think it's a very, um, it's a very well written, it's a very well written repository by my students. So I, I recommend it. Okay, but is that the end of the story? Well, obviously it isn't, because that would be otherwise the end of my talk. Uh, this model is accurate and it's likely useful as a second reader. We are currently testing it, um, but uh, this model is. A little bit naive in the sense that it applies the same amount of computation to all parts of the image, uh, you know, and there is the black background which consumes a lot of computation, and maybe there are some easy parts. And because this image is so big, then there must be a lot of computation wasted on basically nothing. Um, it also needs pixel level labels to achieve strong performance because, as you have, as you might remember, I. I put these uh, those heat maps uh, produced by uh, a patch classifier into the model. And it doesn't really explain its predictions. Uh, and it's, it's really just hard to build trust in something that we don't understand. And this is really particularly important in all medical imaging applications. So that's what uh, caused me to think more about uh, what I called uh, models interpretable by design. What I mean by that is that these are models that can only make a prediction if they can explain their prediction. And uh, an example of such a model is what I call the globally aware multiple instance classifier. That's, uh, that, so this is also a product of my research group. So here, um, it's a pretty complex image, but I can explain it to you uh, if you uh, bear with me for a few minutes. So here, this, uh, this network is first looking at this input image X uh, with some relatively low capacity network. It is creating some representation of this image. And then instead of doing a uh, maxi maximum or, or mean pooling over this representation spatially, it is applying a, uh, a convolutional layer with one by one filters and the sigmoidal linearity. So what it produces, uh, coupled with um, average pooling over uh, those images, what it produces is the saliency map. So the saliency map essentially indicates uh, the, local, the location of the item that uh, caused the prediction. Right, so um, you know, so this this entire so this entire um, network it can only you know it can only make prediction if it because there is this uh, so I'm calling this FAGG. Uh, in this case, this is a something very similar to uh, global average pooling, but this global average pooling acts on these saliency maps, right? So this network can only be able to make accurate predictions if it's actually indicating some localization that causes this prediction. Um, but this is not the end of this. So um, we can look at these locations of the, of the images that this uh, relatively low capacity network considered important. We can look at certain patches. Uh, this is in here, we are doing this with just a greedy algorithm that selects most activated patches. And then we can look at those uh, patches with some higher capacity network, right? Because uh, because they are smaller, we don't have to worry so much about the memory. So we can look at each of these patches separately first, 
and then compute an attention over these patches and create an attention weighted representation. And all that attention weighted representation, we can just simply apply, you know, like a classic, uh, classic, you know, classic sigmoid layer. Um, and finally, we can fuse the information from the global module and the local module in this kind of an architecture. And that gives us a, a final prediction for this entire image. Okay, but how do we train it? Um, okay, so it has these. So like I like I mentioned earlier, it has these. Uh, it has these multiple modules um, that uh, have to be trained in some particular fairly non-standard way, right? So um, yeah. So this is a. So this is a. Uh, Better is a better uh, magnification of this, and so you, you could see so that you could see what's actually happening in these um, in these modules. Uh, and in particular, the mechanism that we used for uh, for computing this localization is this is called the gated attention mechanism. It is simply so these attentions are simply indicating some kind of relative importance to making the prediction, and it's a very simple attention mechanism. Um, Okay, but how is it trained? So it is trained by um, obviously uh, stochastic gradient descent. We have uh, four we have four elements of this loss that uh, that that is trained here. Uh, this is obviously just just binary cross entropy training the global module, uh, separate to training the local module and the fusion. We also have a regularization uh, term here because we want the silencing maps to be Relatively sparse, right? So we don't want uh, we don't want the silencing map to be just pixelated everywhere. Uh, we only want this we only want this network to indicate those pixels that actually correspond to some suspicious regions. And uh, it works very well in practice, as you can see here. Uh, we have so this is these are some so just a few examples of uh, what these uh, what these predictions look like. So this is an updated input. Here, this is a benign change. Uh, this is the map of the patches that our network considered important. Individual, and those individual silency maps for uh, the benign uh, class and the malignant class. So here, it is indeed a benign case. Uh, and our network was able to fairly accurately indicate that uh, this is indeed the benign case. And as you can see here, these patches that the network, uh, the network selected uh, they really indicate. So here you can see that these are well, these are these, those patches here. They really capture the uh, this lesion, and the attention attached to these relevant patches is higher than those to than those that didn't turn out to have something any, something anything important. Sometimes uh, this network is a little bit uncertain uh, about whether this is indeed a benign or a malignant patch. And this is understandable because malignant and benign uh, lesions are often very similar. So I would say that, in fact, it is to be expected that uh, there is going to be some ambiguity between uh, the benign and malignant uh, silency maps. And you can see again that it's uh, it attached the high, it attached the high uh, attention value to those patches that actually contain something um, that is uh, worth examining further. Well, sometimes it's unfortunately it's a little bit confused. So this is a case. This is a failure case. It's actually finding more benign uh, changes uh, that the radiologist discarded, but our network is thinking that it is benign. So. Uh, it is confused by only a little bit, right? So it is indicating them as benign, uh, not as malignant. Okay, and uh, yeah, there are some cases which are just very difficult. And here, here again, this is a very large uh, area that the radiologists, uh, radiologists were not uh, able to localize very well, and our network is uh, also similarly confused about the localization. And that's actually a good sign. Uh, well, the, because this this region is large for the radiologists, uh, and I would like to remind you that all of this is learned without any uh, without these labels, without these annotation labels. We are only using them for evaluation. So, uh, 
it's to, to a large extent, it is showing that there is some correlation between the uncertainty of the radiologists uh, because this region is so large and some uncertainty in the, in the network, right? They were, the network wasn't able to localize it uh, very well because this change is very large and it's hard to pinpoint it. Okay, so um, now this is just a numerical comparison to prior approaches. What I would like to highlight here is that um, even though this network is only using uh, image level labels, uh, so just in, an indication of whether this uh, person this person has cancer or or not, it is actually outperforming some very strong uh, networks that do use pixel level labels. So this is a so this is our prior work. This is the baseline I I uh, I've shown you a few minutes ago, but it also outperforms faster CNN, which is considered a very strong model. Uh, for learning with uh, for learning to detect um, yeah and we have so we we tried of course uh, different varieties of of this network and uh, the strongest network that we have is uh, is an ensemble of uh, it's an ensemble of a few a few networks it uh, it achieves uh, the AUC uh, of 0 0.93 in predicting malignant changes which is really very high. It is, uh, you know, this is uh, this is a very this is a very strong result. So I think, in, in fact, I think there's probably isn't even if we have a perfect model, we probably couldn't, we probably can't make this number zero something like zero point nine nine. We maybe can go to something like zero point nine five or zero point nine six because there is, you know, there's so much uncertainty about um, about making this prediction only from the from the X-ray images. And, but, you know, but actually, I think um, a very interesting uh, thing that uh, this network can do because it is trained with, uh, because it is trained uh, the way, well, it is trained with image level labels is that uh, sometimes there are cases of images that the radiologists consider mammographically occult where they, uh, they have done some other examination uh, to this person and they know that they have cancer but they are unable to point to the cancer on the screening mammogram and that is an example like that so here uh, this person had cancer uh, she had symptoms of cancer so uh, even though the radiologist couldn't see any cancer here uh, she had some further exams and it indicated on the ultrasound that indeed there is a malignant change and our network was actually able to point to that malignant change, despite uh, despite this change being invisible to the radiologist. Okay, so this is also, uh, this network, this more advanced network is also uh, available on the, available on GitHub to you with the, uh, with AGPL license. I also encourage you to take a look and uh, play with it. The, the great thing about this network, I believe, is that it's very, um, it's very generalizable. So we also tried to recently apply this to COVID-19 deterioration. Here we are considering the question of whether this person will deteriorate in 24, 48, 72, or 96 hours. And we have uh, done something again, relatively simple. We just applied our network to this question and we were able to get uh, very good results. Um, so we found some locations that correspond to uh, deterioration and uh, and then you see that we got from these networks were also very good. Um, so I think, you know, so I think the very uh, stimulating thing to think about in the context of uh, scientific applications of uh, deep learning is that we are very used to think about uh, through our, you know, through our courses, through our training, we are used to think about machine, the relation between the prior knowledge like the domain knowledge and machine learning in the in the following way that we you know we read some books and we, or we talk to some experts and then we design our network in some particular way such that it fits this uh, prior knowledge and of course this is a sensible way to think about it but it's not the only possible way and in fact I, I think with these very large data sets uh, becoming you know more available and uh, those very large networks becoming more available and the progress in deep learning, 
I, I think the more interesting uh, direction is actually the opposite, right? So uh, what we can discover, uh, what we can discover about science uh, through machine learning and these explainable uh, deep neural networks. Okay, so let me conclude this. Uh, our network is very accurate and it can uh, serve as a second reader in breast cancer screening, breast cancer screening. Uh, we can improve our models even further with more advanced uh, techniques, more advanced ideas. And uh, our globally aware multiple instance classifier is explainable and applicable to other tasks. However, there is still a lot of exciting room to work and uh, to work. And um, actually we have, uh, we have a lot of papers coming up on improving this uh, globally were multiple instance classifier. These are the references that I uh, mentioned in my talk. And uh, I would also like you to, uh, I would like to encourage you to uh, consider coming to MLNPL uh, virtual event. It's going to happen on the 19th of December, 2020. There are going to be posters, there's going, there are going to be talks, there's going to be networking. Uh, MLNPL is uh, actually it's you know it, it's a it comes from a, a relatively long line of conferences. Uh, this is going to be the fourth year that this conference is organized. Uh, I actually I've been uh, to the first MLNPL in Poland. I had a lot of I had a lot of fun. So I uh, encourage you to go to this website and consider uh, consider uh, registering for it. Okay, so that's 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 my talk. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thanks a lot. It was it was really interesting. So uh, actually, there was another well question related to the previous presentation, but also related to your uh, mm -hmm. your. Uh, maybe I will just briefly read it and rephrase it so it sure. applies to your. Uh, so could you explain why I perform better than uh, medical doctors? So it was about the previous presentation. Uh, for example, uh, what was the feature of features that uh, allow artificial neural network to make better prediction? So if I understand correctly, because you, you have this ability to identify uh, useful patches or, or well, those right. special patches. So this is what is presented mm -hmm. to, to a physician. So physician may, well, let's say, themselves uh, confirm or 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 disapprove yeah. the suggestion so do we understand correctly yeah i think yeah that's it that is correct so you know so i think uh, okay so i think this is actually very important to to mention that that you know we are i mean not just in this application but in general i think we are very far from autonomous ai in medical diagnosis uh and you know there that's not going to happen for probably for many years so all of these tools actually are going to be used as a kind of assistant to you know to the person interpreting those images. Um, okay, and why are they uh, stronger than humans? That's okay. So that's a good question. I think there, but there is no single reason. Um, I think the simplest the simplest way that you can explain it is that you know so a single human can maybe interpret if, you know, if they worked uh, for 10 hours a day, they could maybe read a few hundreds of these uh, studies in one day, right? Um, and they can do this, you know, they can do this maybe for, uh, for, you know, 20 or 30 years, but then eventually they're going to forget what they have learned a very long time ago, right? So this network, so those, those neural networks, not just in this application, but in, in general, if we give them a sufficiently large data set, they're going to be able to learn from the amount of data that is basically impossible to comprehend for any human. Um, so it's a, it just, you know, it's, so it's, you could even, so you could think about this as, uh, you know, it's, it's just it's just beyond our cognitive ability to reason about so many different possible features that there exist uh, in such complex images. Um, the other reason is that uh, we unfortunately, uh, well, we were you know so we evolved from monkeys, 
So, uh, you know, so we are good at, uh, you know, maybe we are pretty good at seeing a, a banana on the tree, but uh, this is not a very complex, this is not a very difficult vision task, right? Or we, so we are basically like, used to see a banana on the tree or, you know, or a tiger in the jungle, but we are not like, uh, you know, we're not like hawks or eagles, right? So we cannot see those very tiny, those very tiny objects very far away. And uh, very often in those medical diagnosis problems, uh, this is the case, right? You basically just, those images are really huge. And the, this, uh, this object that determines the diagnosis is often maybe just, you know, maybe 20 pixels. So if we, so, you know, if, so, you know, if we evolve from hawks, uh, then probably AI would have a much harder time to compete with, compete with, uh, compete with humans, but we unfortunately just, our visual system is just not very well designed for this kind of tasks. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and then finally there are not just beyond the size, there are other limitations of human vision, right? There's, uh, there's the, there's the, there are just the limits of what kind of frequencies we perceive. Uh, so it's, I would say that these are the, those, two, those two effects, right? So the this limitation of the vision in our, in our cognitive system. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, but, but humans are still very good in understanding these explanation post hoc. So if you, they might not be able to necessarily make these predictions, uh, but they will be able to understand them in most cases. And, and you know, and the, I guess the final problem is that uh, you know, AI or the advantage of AI in these medical image analysis problems is that it's AI is relentless. It's not any less. It's not not any more tired at you know at 8 p.m. as 8 a.m. Uh, humans are you know subject to fatigue and you know imagine if you have to look at like hundreds hundreds of these kinds of images every day, you will eventually just uh, get very tired of it. Yeah, that's right. That was also my experience from our projects with ophthalmologists who, who said that they can read images, let's say, effectively for like an hour or two, but then right. their decisions would be mm -hmm. not very accurate. So indeed, right. AI doesn't get tired. So, mm -hmm. so let me uh, proceed with uh, subsequent questions because sure. there are some questions from the audience related specifically to your presentation. Uh, so the first one is, uh, why don't we treat right and left breast separately? We could prepare an architecture for right breast and only and uh, simply reflect the pictures of left breast horizontally. Right, right. Yeah. So okay. So um, okay. So I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure whether you see my screen right now. Okay, you see. You see it now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is in fact what we do, right? So this is in fact what we do. So uh, maybe I wasn't very precise here but you know so when I when I talk about this uh, this architecture here um, you know this like the, the color indicates that this is indeed the same architecture right? this is the same network it, it shares the weights it's just uh, applied twice so those those blue networks are the same networks and those uh, red networks are in fact the same networks. Oh, I see. And I guess the question may be also because in the top layer, uh, it seems that the decision about right breast is also made on the basis of readings for left breast. So, and vice yes, versa. Yes, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So it is, um, that's, that's true. So, you know, so this, um, of course, so I haven't talked about a lot of uh, that went into design of this architecture because it's, these are details, but we have tried that the different ways of concatenating these representations, and uh, we found that this way was uh, the most efficient. So uh, I can intuitively explain uh, the fact that you should uh, concatenate representations from left and right by uh, by an intuition that radiologists have. Uh, so they told me that often if they see something abnormal in one breast, they look on. They look in the right breast to see whether similar patterns are not present in both, because you know those breast tissues are often have. Uh, they often have very complex patterns, and it is. It's sometimes some things that might be normal to some things might be normal to someone, but not to someone else. So you can so you know if you see that someone has some complicated patterns in both breasts, they might just discard it. Uh, and move on, right? It, it's just probably not a cancer. But if, if you have 
very different kinds of patterns in the left and the right, then there is clearly something. There seems no, to be something wrong. There's clinical rational behind it, and you cannot treat well. You need to, to consider a patient as a whole. So it's not yeah. that we have problems left breast and one uh, right breast, but we need to, mm -hmm. to consider a patient as, as one entity. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, the quest next question is the following. First presented model has uh, one layer where it prepares several results with softmax, which then are averaged. Does it really help? Right. Did you conduct any ablation study for this part of the model? Yes, so we have we have done that. So it actually, so, uh, so we have, like I said, so we have done different kinds of, uh, we have really tried many different kinds of uh, uh, experiments on actually what this exact structure should be. Of course, it is a little bit, it's empirical, right? There's, you know, so there is no theory that can drive this kind of a design. Uh, intuitively, uh, beyond what I mentioned about left and right, uh, and how you could actually make predictions about both is, uh, the other intuition that you can think about this is that it's, you know, it's, it's a basically a very similar effect to why an ensemble helps, right? So you could, so you can make a prediction about, you know, the, the cancer in the left breast using one view, but then you also make the prediction of, about the cancer from the other view. And, uh, you know, they two, they both have slightly different uh, data and then, you know, they will make, they will make errors. Uh, they will not make errors consistently, right? So if they, so because they, they because they, they won't, uh, then sometimes they will be able to correct each other. That's why this uh, this averaging. That's why you, we make these four uh, these four predictions, and we average those four predictions. But you, you're right that uh, we could also consider just concatenating all views here, and then only making one prediction and not averaging. But empirically, we found that this was better. But to be honest, I don't think this is a very these aren't these aren't huge differences. Uh, I think those all those architectures, they work similarly well. Hmm. So the next question: Have you tried any visual trick tricks like increasing the contrast uh, or anything similar? Does it impact mm -hmm. the performance? Yeah, that's actually yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we have not, but we definitely should have. Um, so we have done other types of. Uh, augmentations like cropping, uh, resizing, uh, Gaussian, adding Gaussian noise. Uh, so we have, so we have, we have done that. But you're right that uh, I think changing the contrast could also be a very good data augmentation. Uh, I think it's probably actually better than resizing and cropping. Mm -hmm. So maybe because it was the, the last question, at least so far from the audience. So let me ask another one from myself. So uh, as I understand the, uh, your solution was, uh, is offering lo is offering local explanations. So we explain okay. why we have a decision specific decision for a specific patient. So have you also considered uh, global approaches that would rather mm -hmm. provide the knowledge that is hidden in the, uh, in the network? So I would say kind of a global knowledge that is not specific for a given patient, but exists there. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, you know, so I think that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. So I, uh, so we haven't, we haven't done it. Um, but it's, you know, I think, okay, so in the long term, I would say that, uh, you know, beyond making predictions, which is useful, to, sorry, on its own, I, I think that's this uh, kind of this direction is the direction that uh, a lot of this research will go into, right? Because it's uh, so right now, uh, what we can do is uh, do kind of like a semi-automatic knowledge mining, where we, you know, where we uh, so we are running studies like that, where we show these predictions to radiologists, uh, then ask them to confronted with their knowledge and see whether this network has learned something that maybe they were not really um, expecting. But um, yeah, it, I think it would be even more interesting if you could actually just, you know, if you could actually discover some, like if you explicitly discover some medical knowledge through analyzing this network. So that we haven't done yet. 
I think that's probably no. I think that probably would be uh, easier if we also used other data modalities, right? So if we, for example, used uh, maybe images with uh, with the HR data at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. then we could then we could maybe find some more you know like more interesting correlations, uh, like more interesting structure of the you know of the network. Um, that you know that yeah that could be like genuine yeah, that's right that that would be like genuine knowledge discovery through for training these networks yeah because i remember there was a work i think it is even it was uh published by microsoft research when they were creating a uh, a set of rules uh, like multi-level rules mm -hmm. from networks however indeed they, they have more so they also have some demographic information so there was the first level of rules where mm -hmm. was about uh, partitioning patients into subsets depending on their demogra uh, demographics. And then right. there were more, more specific rules that were associated with specific. Now, I don't remember the outcome, but uh, uh, I thought it was interesting. I, I guess in your case, well, you have additional challenge that you only have images. So uh, so then there's also yeah, this so issue. You know, so actually, yeah, so I mean, so, you know, so I think maybe what I should say is that, you know, what I've presented here is maybe 20% of uh, my group's work. So we have, we are doing, a lot of other, we are working on a lot of other projects also related to EHR connecting images and and uh, and uh, images and demographic data. We just haven't yet uh, we just haven't yet published any of that. Um, but yeah, you know, I think this is this is probably. I mean, that's definitely a direction in which it has to go. Uh, just because it's, you know, just because it's. Uh, I think just image making predictions uh, from images is it's already a relatively well explored technology, and you know, and researchers have to keep coming with interesting questions to you know to keep you know to keep being inspired and keep you know being motivated. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, so I understand there's a lot of in front of you, and uh, we should just observe you and, and your group and and. Uh, to, to look for for a new result. So uh, that yeah, was so the last. Huh? Yeah, maybe actually I should maybe also say that you know I think a lot of um, a lot of work in this kind of domains is very difficult to do on your own. So it's actually so what I'm even though I'm talking about you know I'm talking about uh, just to save space. I'm you know I'm I'm not uh, putting all of my quarters, uh, but actually but each of these paper has each of these papers actually has at least 10 quarters it's a very you know this kind of the work in uh the work in medicine in general and machine learning is uh, very labor intensive so um it, when you see you know so we often might see these kind of like papers on paper papers in you know in these kind of uh, like medical journals that have like 40 50 authors it's actually you know it's actually the amount of work that goes into these kind of applied projects is uh is very large so i think on on the first paper that on the first the, the first paper on this list has about thirty authors, and mm -hmm. each of these authors has actually done something non negligible. Uh, and, you know, most yeah, of this that's work is done by my students. Yeah, that's right. This is what I also know from my experience. That uh, working with clinicians is quite challenging, also because of their workload and they are very limited time. So, uh, right. yeah, I really, I'm, I am really impressed by your work. Uh, so actually, it was the last question. Uh, uh, there are no more questions from the audience, and actually, we are slowly approaching the end of this session.